Sorry for the delay. Um, please join me welcoming Rina. She will uh, talk about uh, engineering documentation and how this was introduced at a Google large scale. I believe this will be helpful for all companies out there. Okay, um, as Louis said, my name is, I'm actually Irish, though I live in Seattle, but my name is Rihanna, or I follow the ONA. But after 18 years in Seattle, I tell everybody it's spelled R-I-O-N-A, but it's pronounced ma'am, and it seems to be working, so. Okay, so let's talk about engineering documentation, and let's talk specifically about the fairly widely held perception that engineering documentation kind of sucks. Um, it, I've been 20 years as a technical writer, I've been nine years at Google, and for as long as I have been in the industry, there has been this idea that um, internal engineering documentation is scrappy at best and unreliable at worst. And it's not just internal. Um, did anybody see the Stack Overflow um, survey this year? It was pretty interesting. They asked all um, of their engineers that they surveyed, what is the number one challenge that you have in doing your job? And number two came in at documentation. Poor docs, couldn't find the docs. Um, they don't exist. And actually number one and number three are also around communication. Uh, so you could say that things like documentation occupy the top three spaces. So I'm a technical writer, I'm not an engineer, I'm not an SRE, but this makes me sad. So, Okay, the problems with engineering documentation tend to fall into a number of categories. The information you need, you cannot find. This is a message I got when I tried to book this flight to Ireland, and it was spectacularly useful. The other thing is maybe the information is there. See down at the bottom, the bridge is out ahead, but it's almost impossible to find, right? See, whatever. And almost the biggest problem is that documentation is out of date and irrelevant, and it is strongly outdated. Um, this is one of the biggest things, like obsolete docs are more harmful, I believe, than no docs at all, and that we'd be better off deleting stuff if we wanted to do well. Oh, wrong button. Wrong button again, sorry. Okay, so bad documentation hurts everybody. It's really bad for product velocity. It's bad because you end up redesigning things, reinventing the wheel. It's really bad for getting new team members and new engineers up on board and productive really fast. Um, and it causes a lot of difficulty and rework around communication. It's also pretty bad for product quality. You end up um, troubleshooting, issue solving is really hard. You end up often retesting. Um, it's very common for best practices not to be shared or widely available, and therefore people reinvent the wheel and make the same problems over and over again. And as people know in this room, it's also extremely bad for reliability because when everything hits the fan, you need to be able to find and trust the the information that you need to get things back on track is available again. And this is particularly problematic, I think, for SREs. Um, often, if you're a software engineer, you can just go and ask a wise coworker to explain a difficult concept to you. And, but that's a luxury that is not always available to SREs who are, might be up there alone in the space station like Sandra Bullock and just reach for the manual. And this was the highest, the greatest movie scene for technical writers that has ever existed. Okay, so what are we going to do? So let's have a look. The problem is mainly one of culture. Like every engineer I've spoken to over the last couple of decades, they know they should be writing documentation. She's like, I should. I know I should, but I don't have the time and I don't have the incentive and there isn't a culture around documentation at, at, um, in software engineering and this was certainly the case at Google. The real problem is that documentation really is everybody's problem but often and far too often it's nobody's job. And this is very much the case also, and this was the case also at Google. Um, we have about, I think, 17,000 engineers, or we have a great, we have many engineers, and we have hardly any technical writers, and most of those 
are working on public projects or they are working on very high priority projects. And the reality is that most engineers at Google and most SREs need to create and maintain their own documentation. And they try, but it's kind of difficult. The thing is, the culture of documentation is not there, but that doesn't mean that that cannot change. Culture is not immutable, and I think even in the software industry, we have a really good example of, uh, that we can follow when we're looking to fix the documentation problem, and that's testing. So if you, I really believe that testing is very much, uh, documentation is very much where testing was about 10 years ago. Um, about 10 years ago, this was kind of the model of testing, right? It was a little bit ad hoc. It wasn't really reliable. Um, it wasn't really part of the software development process in a formal way. And of course, that ended up costing a great deal, you know, in terms of reliability, in terms of standards. <coughs> But things changed. There was a will to change and a, recognize, a recognition that this was a problem. And certainly Google and throughout the industry, what's happened is that over the last 10 years, we have seen that software has become a very professionalized discipline and it is fully integrated into the software development process. There is no way somebody can start checking stuff into the Google code base or probably anybody's code base unless you are testing it. You write code, you write tests, it's part of your job, and it's expected to, you're expected to do it. So, bad documentation is bad. Good documentation is good, but good documentation, I do believe, is achievable, even if, it's only, if engineers have to do it themselves in, while actually writing code and shipping product and uh, running things in production. And what I want to talk about is how over the last two years, in fact almost to the day over the last two years, Google has really transformed our documentation process. Um, we've really made a huge sea change in both culture and in technology. And I want to talk about how that happened and why that happened. Some of this talk is very specific to Google. For example, um, our technology and our tooling was designed because Google has our monolithic um, code base, Google 3, in which most of our development work takes place. But there are still a lot of really um, generally applicable principles that we found actually worked. And a lot of these come down to themes that came out in the last couple of days at this conference. I'm thinking we, um, we were talking about, today I went to uh, Rich's talk about team values, and that was really important as part of culture. But we also talked about things, um, LinkedIn, and I'm blanking, I'm so sorry. Um, we talked about things like evolution, that um, things systems need to evolve, and we talked about alliances and partnerships and pathologies. So, wrong button again, there we go. So, why did this project start? It did start because of Google's internal survey, which is called Googlegeist. It happens every year. And it's taken incredibly seriously. They ask every single employee a lot of questions about their well-being, their health, their management, their productivity, their work. And one of the questions they ask tech Googlers is, what is the biggest challenge that you face? 48% of Googlers said that their biggest impact on productivity was the lack of findable, trustworthy documentation they needed to do their job. That's a lot. And We've also seen similar things with SRE. When we do our stress tests and we looked at the um, issues that come up, at least 50% of them cite problems with docs at some stage in the problem. Either lack of docs may have caused the problem or the problem could have been ameliorated much earlier if adequate docs had been available at a predictable location. So, a coworker of mine, another technical writer and myself, we were actually kind of rolling off a project right now. We had a bit of time and we kind of saw this as kind of like an emergency. This is like a code yellow for our profession, frankly. And, but we had also been through the mill a couple of times before of really trying to fix this problem before and we had not succeeded. And we took a couple of different approaches for that and we wanted to look at why those failed. The first approach that we did was we decided let's fix the culture of docs. 
let's fix it by trying to instill it in teams, and the way we did it was very bottoms up. Um, a writer would go into a team, they'd say, we want a site and we want it on the wiki, or we want it in Google Sites, and the writer would work with the team and get their docs into great shape, identify gaps, put up a maintenance plan, and leave, and go on to the next product, and within three months, docs fell into entropy again. Didn't work. The second approach we tried was top-down, and this was to address the tooling, and myself and a couple of colleagues spent almost a year pretty much trying to design this overall arching system that would tie together content in different repositories and associated with projects and code and do all of this. And we presented our findings and proposals, and our VP in no uncertain terms said that would take about 10 or 12 engineers a year to do, it's not going to happen. And we're like, okay. And we went to try to find something else to do. So when I, we looked at why this doesn't work, as um, Joy said in her um, in the SRE panel on Monday, actually we were doing the wrong thing. We were trying to inflict help on engineers. We were coming in as technical writers and telling engineers, we think this is your problem. You don't have this right culture. We're going to fix that for you, and this is how you're going to do it. Or in the tooling way, we were going to say, you're doing it wrong. Let us tell you what was go we're going to do it right. And what we found is that bottom-up certainly doesn't scale, and bottom-down doesn't fly because, for a number of reasons. It doesn't fly because nobody tells Google engineers what to do basically, and I'm a much happier woman since I accepted that. Um, but it also didn't work because we were trying to design something for a hugely complex ecosystem that we could impose on the top. And as Kurt talked about, and it was talked about on Monday, things don't work like that. You can't do an all or nothing product like that. Things need to evolve with the ecosystem. So we decided that instead of coming in and telling engineers what they're doing wrong, we were going to, my coworker and I were going to just listen to them. And we talked to as many engineers as we can. We said, what's the problem? Tell me your pain points. You know, we want to hear you and see what is the problems that you're facing. And we found three very, very consistent points with every single person we talked to. And one was, in the first case, documents don't exist. People don't write them, people don't create the documentation. And even if they do create the documentation, you can't find them. I'm going to share a horrific, a horrific statistic. When we started this project, documentation was spread across the wiki and it was spread across a million different drive documents and um, Google sites. There were 137,000 Google Sites in Google that were being indexed by our internal search engine. 90% of those had fewer than one visitor a month. I know that I had at least 30 sites called test in my drive. You know, All of these were being indexed. The statistics were the same for the wiki. About 90% of them were just completely unmaintained. And the problem with dead documents like that is they obscure real information, and they're misleading and harmful. And the third thing is, if the docs exist, and if you can find them, you have no way of looking at it to know if it's trustworthy. Are these code samples, these static code samples? I won't know if they work until I try and run them. I don't know if the doc owner is around. I don't know if it's official. There is no connection between the docs and the code. So, when we said, why don't, why don't you write the docs then? They were saying, well, We've no time to do it, and we have no incentive to do it. And this comes back to the culture again. Like, if I'm an engineer, and I know I'm going to be rewarded at perf and at promo time for shipping this feature or doing this, why would I do this work that is sometimes perceived as grunt work and not rewarded on that? So there was no incentive, and there was no time, and it wasn't seen as fundamentally part of the job. So when we delved down a bit further and said, okay, culture is the problem, why do you think this is? Why is it so hard to go and do that? We made the realization that our documentation model across Google Engineering and SRE really and truly was completely broken because here is the model that we had. We had this beautiful code base, best, amazing code base, beautifully tested and integrated and organized, and all your code lives there and your docs live anywhere you want. Your docs can be in sites, the docs can be in wiki, they can be in drive, they can be a post-it note on your folder. And this kind of fragmentation 
which we again was a theme that came up in this conference, is really, really problematic because First of all, if you want to create docs, now you have to think, okay, do I go and do it in sites or do I go and do it in wiki? Where is it? And what template should I use? And all of this. And you have to switch context. You lose flow. This is what engineers don't want to do. And also, if I was to put a dollar amount on the engineering hours spent fiddling with sites HTML, I would be a rich woman. Um, the other thing is they're really, really hard to maintain. Again, because there's no connection with the code and you have to context switch and leave where you are, you're at. So if you update a file, yeah, maybe if, you know, are you really going to just quit what you're doing and go and find where that document is and see where it is and see what you need to update? It didn't happen. And again, think of those statistics about the unmaintained docs. They're impossible to find. So. The realization that we came is documentation will never, ever be part of um, engineering culture until it's fully integrated, not just with the code base, but also with the workflow. Easier said than done, but maybe not. And this was the birth of the project that we call G3Doc, which is the platform we created. Radically simple documentation. We wanted to take the toil and the labor out of creating documentation so that it is just a natural part of what you did. And this is our radically simple theme and branding. We were very strong about branding, so we were going to have a fancy logo. And there was, no, terminal green, courier font. It's radically simple. So the vision was engineers can find, create, and maintain documentation using their regular workflow and developer tools. They don't have to leave to do any of this. How are we going to? Whoop. I'm skipping. Spoilers. <laughs> okay, there we go. Back to the design. So, I'm bringing a clicker next time. Sorry about this. Somebody tell me when I'm, my mouse is near the present button. <laughs> oh. The other right? Anyway, while this is happening, I'll tell you what the design was. The design was, let's put content in simple markdown right next to its associated code. For every project in our code base, we're going to create a directory called G3Doc, not doc, because people would have had doc things for this stuff. And in there, you're just going to create the simplest See what the arrow keys do. No. The problem is I can't see it on my screen, so. Okay. The presenter view has vanished. Thank you. See it on my screen. There we go. All right. How's the suspense? Are you dying to know how it ends? <laughs> okay. And the context menu keeps popping up on my. Hmm. Okay. Yay! 
way, radically simple documentation. Radical, this is the vision. This is the design. We're going to write our content in the simplest of markdown, and you store it exactly with your code and your associated code. Then serve these docs as web pages at a predictable URL. So we want the server, it would render the markdown directly from source control. It would apply theming so that all separate presentation and content were separated and then ship the finished HTML to the user. One of the advantages of having Markdown is that it's also super readable in source, as everybody knows from GitHub. So the people could read it using the normal uh, code browsing tool if they wanted to. And we also wanted to do meaningful integrations with workflow tools. So this is kind of where the magic happened. So Aaron and I, the um, technical writers, just sent an email to Steve, an SRE in Munich, who owned a server and said, hey, Steve, yeah, can you serve out a Google 3, please? And we came in the next morning, and there was a design doc. And over the next nine days, we did this proof of concept. So you can see that the source on the back there gets rendered here. It's not particularly pretty, and you can see that we have things like style sheets are still in the source document itself and scripting. But it was a proof of concept the server could serve out of source control. And we found a friendly team who was unhappy with the docs, and we said, hey, you want to be our guinea pig? They said yes. And in nine days, Steve had the server up and running. He'd done a security review, done all the configuration, and we had a much prettier site that looks like simple source like this. This is your markdown. And all the serving and rendering was moved um, server side. So you can see that um, your table of contents gets automatically generated, things get linkified, you've got navigation that comes, these are just bullet markdown lists, there is search. And you can also see that it's richly linked, and one of the things that um, it helps, down by the bottom right you see the page info. So you can see, you can instantly know, because it's reading from source control, when it was last updated, you can click it and it will open the doc in the IDE, in the web IDE that we have, and you can edit it directly or you can view the source. You can see the history from source control, so it's all there. And it's a predictable URL that uh, mirrors its spot in the thing. Okay, so the feedback was actually amazing. This, this was really nice feedback from the team. And this was the first time I'd ever heard an engineer say that. This, this was good. This was thing. But then shit got real. And what happened was we had our guinea pig thing. And then there were a couple of other teams who were close to that team who said, we like this. And we set them up and did this. And then two really great things happened. And one is we came into work one day and we saw all these change lists because I stalked our code base like a hawk. Nobody could do anything without me knowing about it. And I was like, I don't even know who these people are. We don't know. People started doing it themselves without even talking to us. And that was really great. The other way, um, really great thing that happened was we were still not as rich platform as we wanted to be. And all of a sudden, engineers and writers, often who wanted to use this for their projects but found certain features were lacking, came to us and said, we want to help. Let us join the team. Let us build this for you. And the three of us were like, oh, well, it's our baby. And then we said, no, this is, this is what needs to happen. And it was a really great thing. And we took this time, because shit was getting real, to actually think about our core principles and, as Rich said in session just before lunch, about our values. And one of the reasons we were able to do this is that we were still all just volunteers. We're still doing this as a skunk work project. So we thought the core principles for the product design, we're going to focus on the engineer, not on technical writers, even though the origins were in technical writers. It's the engineering workflow that we want, we want engineers to get in, out, quick and dirty, get it done, and have it as simple as possible. We also thought about how we want to grow this. We had had these failed efforts before, inflicting help, telling people they're wrong, and we resolved that this would not happen this time. That if, en if we were to build a better mousetrap, engineers would come and do it. But if we were wrong and it didn't happen, you know, we would just go back to our day jobs. It was still just a 20% project, and that was fine. We wanted to partner with teams. We wouldn't build things ourselves if there was no need to. 
And we would start small, release, iterate, constantly push out small new improvements and get people interested. And finally, although we didn't sell things to people, I have to say a lot of the G3Doc uh, project, our success was based, it was kind of based on marketing and social media. And part of it, we shared a lot of information. We're super open. And again, because people don't like tech writers telling them what to do, we formed a lot of partnerships with very senior and influential in engineers. And sometimes I would like, hey, we just launched this. I was going to announce it, but it would be better coming from you. You know, and that, that really helped. We got a lot of support and it was really great. And the other thing, because we were, everybody was self-selected, everybody was kind of on a mission, we were like, this is an opportunity to look at, as Rich would say, our core values. And what are our values? Everyone was there because they wanted to solve the problem. So we decided we wanted to be open, transparent, and generous. And that was both with ourselves and with our customers. Part of this was we wanted to move fast and iterate often, so we had a policy of no cookie licking. Do you know what cookie licking is? It's There's a feature you want to work on, but you don't have time, so you lick it and put it there so nobody else can touch it. And we're like, no, that's not going to happen anymore. You pass it on if you can't do it. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had opportunity for impact. And we also wanted to make sure that if you want to influence the direction of the platform, come and build it. Governance belongs to the contributors. So, things went quite nice. Um, we launched in the middle of July with one site. By September, we had 18, 159 at the end of December. And so we set a super, super aggressive goal that we wanted 300 projects um, at the end of Q1. And by this stage, I actually had it on my OKR. By this stage, um, Everybody else is 20%, but I was 100%, but really it's the team because I don't produce Jack. So, um, at the end of Q1, we actually had 930. It killed me that it wasn't around 1,000, but whatever. Okay. We kept launching new features all the time. These are examples of them. There's actually a lot of features, and I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Obviously, this is HTML stuff, tables, good tables, things like that. But we did other things, like we built in math jacks. So if you just wrote an expression up there in your source markdown, the server would just take care of all the rendering. We did the same for sequence diagrams, dot graphs, um, syntax highlighting, so you put in a markdown code block like that, we'd handle all the formatting. And it was um, received very nicely. And around this time, um, Staz, another SRE in the Munich office, um, developed Eng Play, which is G3Doc for playbooks. Um, because playbooks have different requirements, right? First of all, they have to be available when shit goes down, right? And so they need to be checked, and there's a lot of security requirements, and also um, to be integrated with our alert manager. So this is another platform that was built on G3Doc. And we got a lot of very positive feedback, and the momentum was really, really growing, and it was growing without us selling it, which was the really great thing. The quote down there is actually my favorite, that he didn't dream it up. Um, and this, you know, and all of this helped. Like, we didn't sell it, but as soon as somebody put something like that on G+, I shared it to everybody. You know, I, I, I might not have been selling it, but I made sure everybody else heard about it. So. By the beginning of June, we had almost 1,800 projects had migrated to G3Doc. And then shit really got real, because um, our senior VP, Urs, made an announcement. He said, everybody, the tech organization needs to move to G3Doc. We want this to happen. At this stage, we were still a team of volunteers, and now we had the entire tech organization with a mandate to move. But actually, things went. Things went pretty smoothly. The thing is, the service is so simple to use. You just drop a markdown file in a directory, and everything is taken care of for you. Um, this is our hockey stick thing. You can see down there um, our first site around there. Um, that big peak is where Urs did his thing. And we hit 10,000 about a week ago, and I just about died. So. Okay, so where are we at today? Like, is the pro are we on the way to addressing the problem of documentation? So, the first thing is adoption, and we've seen there's 10,000 um, projects using it. And that's, that's pretty 
great. And in the early days, this was the first thing I looked at when I woke up in the morning, was how many projects are using this. And you can see that there's 17,000 authors, individual people have submitted change lists. Um, but in a way, anybody can create docs. And to solve the documentation problem, you need to see, are they maintaining docs? You know, because that's where everything fell apart and everything goes to hell. So, statistics that we have, we call these virtuous change lists. This is a change list that contains code. You change the code, and in the same change list, you go up and you edit the doc file that's associated with this code. 30% of documentation changes now contain code, which is pretty active. There's 200,000 files in there, and more than 200,000 change lists, and the monthly rate per file is about three change lists per file. So we're cautiously optimistic that people are maintaining the documentation because it's very easy for them to do so. It's very easy for them to find, and they just click up a directory, and there it is sitting in its documentation directory. Are people using it? Like are people finding the documentation and using it? Uh, we now have 3.9 million. 30-day uh, page views, and these are people page views. These are not um, crawling or anything like that. And we have 1.6 million 30-day sessions, and this is for internal documentation. What we have really is pretty much all of engineering has moved to D3Doc. Um, there are still some legacy sites around, but we are going to be closing down our wiki. Um, really, sites are not being used anymore. We have Eng Play for playbooks, and we also launched Company Doc, which is a Google-wide version of G3Doc with more lax security requirements, so anybody can read it. To read G3Doc, you need to have source control access. So, yeah, by Wiki, it's turning down in about two weeks, so that'll be one content source that is gone away. And how's the team doing? Um, in January, Google decided to invest in documentation, so we now have a fully staffed and funded engineering team. We have an engineering manager, two full-time engineers who are working on this, me as well, and we also have our amazing 20% contributors who are continuing to do this, and it's so important to our culture. G3Doc is built by engineers for engineers. And the other thing that's really exciting is that we are part of core developer infrastructure. We are part of the same team that deals with um, code search and browse and review and this. Because just like the code browsing tool, we are a view on the source. So, and best team, actually best team at google.com will get the G3 doc team. Um, so what do we learn from this? We, this is what we believe to be true from doing this process. Tooling comes first. We saw when we tried to do this before, we went rah, 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 let's make beautiful sites. Um, it didn't work because it was still too hard to go, and go to your wiki or your whatever and do it. Fix the tooling first. Be audacious but not reckless. One thing um, that we kept really quiet about was we were, from the very beginning, from day one, we said, this has to become the standard. Otherwise, we are going to have another, another content, um, content management system is just going to make things worse. It'll be a better way of making things worse. It has to become the standard. And this is where I wanted to have this insert XKCD cartoon about competing standards here. But be audacious. But we were audacious. We had this vision, but we proceeded very slowly. Release and iterate again, proceed very slowly. I know I'm got four minutes left, so I'm... This is the key thing. Whatever kind of tooling you're working for, G3Doc was designed because of our code base, because most of our development work takes place in Google 3, a single code base. That may not work for everybody. If it's at all possible, I think docs should live with their code, but the core thing, pick a single platform and make it predictable. However you set it up, make it predictable so that it is really, really easy to find. Like, in an ideal world, it shouldn't be easy even for, it shouldn't be just easy for humans to find. A system should be able to say, for this API, I can predict where the documentation is going to be. That is, the, pick a single platform and standardize on it. Partner with as many people as you have, can, with influencers, with workflow tools, with, with leaders, 
Um, this was incredibly important. And above all, for us, it was focus on the engineer. It was kind of challenging for us to take off our tech writer hats because, you know, we're about beautiful prose. And we're not about beautiful prose. I think that's a waste of time for engineering documentation. It's nice, but it's not essential. But let's focus on the engineer who needs to get back to her job. She needs to write her code and test it and get promoted and do all of that, but she also needs to write her docs. There's a lot of parallel efforts that are going on within the documentation infrastructure team around standardization of content and around building in templates and guidelines into our IDEs and tools. That's a separate effort that is underway now. But focus on the engineer, pick a single platform, go for it. Our code name was actually, there's an onion story called Five Glades, which I'm not going to put up here, um, but it's about going for it, and that was our code name for quite a long time and just go all out. Focus on the engineer. Focus on the engineer. That's actually the same side. I did it twice, but the transition is gone. So, I'm two minutes under. Yes. I'm one minute under. Okay, I'm done. That was impressive. Um, was any external incentive required to get engineers to use the system like was necessary to get people to write unit tests? Oddly enough, no. Oddly enough, no. Um, engineers, what happened was I think this was an example of a platform driving culture a little bit that engineers saw it and thought it was cool and then they saw other teams doing it and then because you can read the documentation as you browse the code in the code browser. You don't have to go to the web to see it. People began to expect it. And also, it was extremely easy to create it. Um, there were, I'm not saying every single team like leapt all over it, but by and large, we were really surprised at how receptive engineers were to it. And in fact, going back to what I said earlier, like engineers all felt bad that they didn't create documentation. Do you know what I mean? They wanted to do the right thing. It was just too hard. And it just took away, this makes it a lot easier for them to do it. It takes away the friction and the toil. Now, are you heckling? No, no, this is a completely <laughs> legitimate question. Um, excellently delivered and well recovered. Thank you very much. I think uh, one of the things I'd say is, I agree that the focus on being able to turn some well-known token, such as a path and a code base, into a path which could be used to retrieve documentation. It's an extremely useful feature. Some people in the audience might be wondering why a search engine company has more focus on that than searchable documentation. Our internal corpus of searchable docs is enormous. It's getting a little less now the wiki is going away. But it is still enormous, but it's not enormous in the way that Google.com, the World Wide Web, is enormous. And that's a data to train on, right? One of the things we're doing, though, is we are integrating the future that we think for G3Doc. The platform itself is kind of really rich now. And where we want to focus is on integration. And actually, our goal for the next year, we've been focused on documentation, but we want to move it beyond documentation into engineering knowledge. And that's everything an engineer needs to do a job. So it could be like, there's the code, there's the docs that are now connected, but how can we connect that to organizational data and how can we connect it to location? So who in this office is working on that and where are their OKRs and can I see the change lists and the bugs and the issues about that? So kind of building and exposing a knowledge graph with the vision that the information, not just the docs, but the information you need to do your job is at your fingertips no matter what stage of the workflow that you're at. And we can do that. We're in the stage of kind of building these connections. We don't know quite how yet we're going to expose them, but we will expose them. <laughs>